And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is perhaps one of the first theological advances we make as Christian children. Letting go of our early commitment to the concrete, we come to understand with the help of our Sunday school teachers that the church is not, properly speaking, a building, but a family, a community of the baptised, one body with Jesus Christ as our head. And we must remain mindful of that truth as the church, as a church, when, as maturity sets in, we're inevitably re-immersed in more material concerns. But we must also allow our buildings and those who imagined and maintained them and those who, for better and for worse, worshipped in them over the years to inform us, challenge us, about the faith that we share with them and help us to bind us into a wider family, that wider family we belong to as Christians, uniting the ages, uniting present with past and future. Unless we see ourselves in that context as one part of a wider truth, we won't make much sense of our faith or of a difficult gospel like this morning's. We're famously lucky to have a building of such striking quality. It provoked strong opinion from the outset. Ruskin liked it, which was quite a coup. Others, of course, didn't. One benightedly middle-class visitor the other day, LRB in hand, suggested to me how wonderful it might be if only it were whitewashed. (laughs) Another earlier and rather more imaginative critic wrote of these tall, dark, gloomy, red and black brick buildings, how they seem the abode of learned black friars settled in this out-of-the-way region to escape the observation of the purblind Protestants. For another, it was the most beautiful, most vigorous, most thoughtful church of its time. And for John Summerson, despite, perhaps even because of its strident ugliness as he sees it, the most moving building of its century, Wuthering Heights in banded brick. That greatest Victorian poet, perhaps the only great Victorian poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, stood at the door and marveled at our touching and passionate curves, which later Ian Nairn even cheekily labeled orgasmic. It certainly challenges, compels, makes demands on all our senses. Alarmed by its aesthetic perfection, wrote one early 20th century commentator, some have assured me that while they like to visit all saints once in a while, they find that regular attendance is followed by a kind of spiritual indigestion. Overhearing what the vicar's put in his trifle today, I think it might be indigestion of a more mundane kind that follows mass today. (laughs) Butterfield's use of space is often considered one of his major achievements, a cathedral-like effect in a tiny corner of Fitzrovia, in a building that both harked back to the best of medieval Gothic, but also employed the latest techniques in the era of the Great Exhibition. So we're reminded not just of the communion of saints made perfect in heaven in the church's many images, grateful though we are for that community around us. What a joy it is to see them willing us on and waiting for us in heaven. More fundamentally, we're given a sense by this building of the embodied sacramental reality of our faith and how that faith understands and indeed underpins time. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past. Eliot's words at first difficult, mystifying, but they begin to make sense, don't they, in a context like this. They speak the language this building speaks. 
at the center of the East Wall, the discrete events of manger, cross, and celestial throne stand united in space and time, set above that altar at which we today mysteriously participate in the singular sacrifice of Calvary. Time collapsed, time expanded, time reordered, a present reality made of the past, a future already present for some, yearned for, pointed towards, broken in upon in this building. Here is encompassed, here is encompassed and commissioned a great truth about our Christian faith. This building proclaims itself as a little center of the world, its own small eternity, and at the same time points us outwards into the world's remotest corners, binding present to past and past to future. This is a building and this is a festival today of comfort and of challenging commission. Today especially, we're both given the comfort of having our loved ones alongside us and being made aware of that beautiful truth, and also given the challenge to go out and to live up to God's difficult call. Theological truth, unsurprisingly, finds itself reflected in our lives, in our experience. Aren't we aware of the persistent presence of the past, the irreducible relevance of childhood experience, the work we often need to do with that experience for our own sakes and for the sakes of others? We're prompted against this backdrop to work with our inheritance, discerning appropriate loyalty over the ages and sometimes the need to let go. The past lingers, ghosts and cherished memories, just as the future looms, hopeful and frightening. Our present is shot through by dreams of the past and by expectation of the future. Aren't we touched? Aren't we comforted by the way this building brings us into contact with those who have gone before and challenged us to fight for the good of those yet to come? As we stand in the very spot in which Hopkins stood, let us remind ourselves that the mysterious economy of God is a more expansive affair than we sometimes imagine with our ordinary conceptions of time. All this is relevant because we meet the challenge, the unworld, it's particularly relevant as we meet the challenge of Luke's Beatitudes, the challenge and unworldliness of Luke's Beatitudes. In our adversity, we're reminded of what God promises. Likewise, in our prosperity, we're reminded of the plight of others, the need to be thankful and of the dangers of complacency. And against this backdrop of time reconfigured, we can afford to let ourselves see how our very weariness, our emptiness, our failure in terms of the world, themselves become opportunities to be filled with the grace of God. This gives us space, doesn't it, to have patience with ourselves and with others. We're all given vocations as Christians. Vocation is misunderstood if it is meant to be the only thing I could have done. Every vocation, however sincere, involves leaving certain things behind. It involves doors closing, tracks diverging, sometimes arbitrarily. But in the economy of God that promises on a vaster scale ultimate meaning, we can afford more happily to take the often difficult paths God wills for us, knowing that we will be filled, we will be comforted, we will rejoice and leap for joy. It's a wonderful and challenging reality that God has given us all we need in the sacraments to be saints, all we need at baptism to become the saints that we see depicted around us. Not many of us will attain to that state 
this side of death. I hope that doesn't sound like discouragement, but I have to admit that some of my favorite people are far from saintly. Hopkins, Eliot, Iris Murdoch, all fascinated by the idea of sainthood, but far from classic candidates for canonization. We don't need to mention Ian Nairn. But we're offered, considering this backdrop of a richer sense of time and place, the broader economy of salvation, a promise that in time, moving, interweaving in ways we can only just imagine, all will be made well. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. This isn't nostalgia or complacency. Our past challenges us on as well as encourages us on. Nor is it the suspension of good until a future beautiful life. It remains incumbent upon us, all of us, to fight the good fight with God's grace to overcome our weakness. But amidst a torn and unhappy world, let us as a church remember that nothing is wasted in the economy of God. If only we look now in this world to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen.